Welcome everyone. This is um, our bi-weekly um, meeting on protein and molecular ML. Um, we're absolutely thrilled today to have uh, Joey and Tara from Mila um, join us to tell us about uh, fold flu. Um, Joey has just defended his work, uh, his thesis in Mila and is heading off to a postdoc in the Bronstein lab in the UK. Um, so, um, they're going to um, give us a uh, in, in depth and sort of hopefully a discussion around um, around their recent work. So um, hopefully we'll have some questions and um, yeah, we're looking forward to a good discussion. So please take it away. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, uh, as Matthew mentioned, I'm Joey and I have my co-first author here, Tara, with me. And so this work is a the uh, recent work that we did on kind of trying to apply generative models uh, to modeling protein backbones. Uh, so in this work, we kind of took like a more of a machine learning first perspective, but I hope uh, because of the, the diverse group that we have, we can touch on some of the cool experimental sides as well. So without getting into you, uh, without waiting anymore, let's get started. So uh, the first thing I want to like start with is like, how do we represent protein backbones for our particular use case? So uh, since this group is kind of familiar with some of the wor uh, work that came out on SC3 diffusion and RF diffusion, uh, this should be very familiar to all of you here. So really what we kind of do is that we say a, a, a protein backbone uh, of length N has essentially four heavy atoms. And then each, uh, I guess, residue can be modeled as a frame in a SC3 N coordinate system, which is the group of uh, Euclidean, special Euclidean symmetries, which includes translations or rotations, but not reflections. So in essence, what we can say is that each residue starts off with an inertial frame, so a, a idealized frame, and then you can apply some sort of rotation, let's say R, and some sort of translation, and then it's gonna be modeled somewhere in 3D space, right? And, and we say that uh, we have a collection of N of those, and N refers to the length of the protein as well. Uh, also, I should mention that if uh, if any of you have any questions, uh, do feel free to stop me and I can uh, answer right away. So um, this should be relatively straightforward. So in our notation, we say that a collection of a rotation R and a translation S is this, this object X. And we have one X per residue. So uh, because we say our protein backbones live in the group SC3N. Like what is the group SC3? So SC3 is composed of, as I mentioned, rotations and translations. So the rotation part is actually the subgroup SO3, so a special orthogonal group in three dimensions. And really each element of this group is a rotation matrix three by three. And I, I'll remind you what a rotation matrix is. The rotation matrix is any orthogonal matrix such that the determinant is equal to a one, right? And then there's multiple ways to represent rotation matrices or groups elements of SO3, uh, but one convenient uh, fact that I would like to uh, bring up is that uh, associated with any group, and this happens to be what's known as, as a Lie group, which is also uh, a Riemannian manifold, uh, there's a Lie algebra. So the Lie algebra the, of the group is essentially uh, the vector space at the identity element of the group. And this is a really important fact for us because the vector space part is key because it allows us to do a lot of the, the deep learning operations that we're kind of familiar with. The Riemannian manifold structure itself is a bit harder to work with, but it's important for the geometric picture. But really, a lot of the computation that we're going to leverage is going to actually leverage the Lie algebra. And so for SO3, the Lie algebra happens to be uh, skew symmetric matrices. So I'll remind you what a skew symmetric matrix is. So a skew symmetric matrix is, again, a three by three matrix such that the transpose is equal to its uh, the negative of the matrix. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned, like uh, SO3, it's the group of rotation matrices, but there's multiple ways to parameterize these group elements. So the most familiar one is, of course, rotation matrices, but you can also have things like rotation vectors. And these are essentially, uh, you have a vector which tells you the angle of rotation is about its axis, and, and the magnitude tells you how much you have to rotate. And then there's Euler angles, which are kind of like useful for visualizations. And then there's also quaternions. And quaternions are actually kind of this new, not new, like, this unique number system where you have essentially four real numbers, W, X, Y, and Z. And all of the I's over here, I, J, K, are unit vectors that are mutually orthogonal to each other and they can be imaginary. And quaternions are kind of like useful for numerical computation reasons because they're much more stable in terms of a number system than traditional uh, rotation matrices or rotation vectors. So the first thing we have to kind of do is that because we're working with SO3, we have to kind of like 
be able to define a metric on, on the manifold. So, uh, uh, and for those who are not familiar, the metric uh, on a manifold is kind of what allows you to do a lot of this important computations, like measuring angles, distances, and as well as like measuring lengths, right? And this is going to be super key for us because from in machine learning context, we need all of these objects to compute losses as well as distances when we generate 3D structures. So you kind of, where this is going to come into play is essentially all of the backbones will have an SO3 group element, and we're going to be able to compare this with some ground truth cost. So uh, what is the metric that we choose? So in our case, any metric on SO3 can be uh, decomposed as a, as a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. So this matrix Q that I have over here. And essentially what we can say is that, well, we can make a canonical choice. Let's If we set Q equals to uh, 0.5, of the identity matrix, it induces this kind of inner product. So the inner product is very key because it tells you the, the bilinear form that is essentially defined at every single point or group element. And the bilinear form is, takes in two vectors, which are the tangent vectors, or in our case, also the Lie algebra elements, so R1 and R2. And it tells you what the, I guess, some sort of, uh, I guess, metric on these two vectors are. So in the case of SO3, this happens to be the trace. Right, so this happens to be the, uh, the the matrix trace of the two algebra elements, and I'll remind you, R one and R two over here are skew symmetric matrices. So, if you give me this metric, which is this inner product over here, I can use it to define the distance. Now, the distance on SO three using this particular metric happens to be the essentially the Frobenius norm of the logarithmic map. So, if you know a little bit of differential geometry, the logarithmic map essentially tells you how to go from the manifold to its associated uh, algebra. So, and the exponential map is the reverse operation, which tells you how to go from the, essentially the algebra to the manifold itself. So essentially, what are we doing? We're taking two rotation matrices, let's say over here, R1 and R2. And now we translate this back to the manifold, uh, to the algebra rather, using the logarithmic map. And now, because it's in the algebra, these are now skew symmetric matrices. And then we take the Frobenius norm, which is the matrix norm, which tells you that, I guess, in some sense, uh, how different they are. Now, if you want a geometric picture, uh, this kind of tells you what's the relative angle between R1 and R2. So this is telling you the relative distance between rotating R1 and R2. So all of this has a very uh, like intuitive geometric picture to, associated with it. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, because SO3 happens to be a Lie group, which is again, a group which is also a Ramanian manifold, the, the operations which are going to be very key for us, which is the matrix, uh, sorry, the exponential map and the logarithmic map, happen to coincide with the matrix exponential and the matrix logarithm. Now to compute these quantities uh, in practice, these are infinite power series. So the first one is, as you, as you can see over here, is an infinite power series. The second one is also an infinite power series. And because of this, we often have to truncate this in practice to actually allow for a finite computation. Now the matrix uh, exponential is relatively okay, but the matrix logarithm is a bit problematic for us. And the reason it's problematic is that it's extremely computationally expensive to compute. So we're gonna need a way to kind of bypass this operation as much as possible. And one of the main tricks of full flow is how do we actually bypass this for SO3s particularly? Uh, so before we move on to all those tricks, I just wanna quickly highlight uh, protein backbones are on SE3N, which are repeated copies of SE3. So again, SE3 is a combination of SO3 as well as a translation. So translation we're all familiar with because it works in RED. So each element in SE3 can be written as a, a rotation, a translation, and this one element over here. And correspondingly, SE3 is also a Lie group, which means it has a Lie algebra. And the Lie algebra, again, has a skew symmetric matrix, and S is, is again, the same translation. Uh, so similarly to SO3, we need to also define a metric in SE3. So the, the cool thing is that because of our previous choice of metric, we can kind of induce a similar type of metric over here. And really what happens is that the inner product of SE3 kind of decomposes into two separate inner products. And it just is very additive. So an inner product in SO3 and an inner product on, on R3. So the R3 inner product is, is just your vanilla dot product that you're probably familiar with. And the SO3 inner product is what we kind of defined earlier. Now, if you use this metric that we've kind of defined over here, the distance uh, between two SE3 elements happens to be the square root of the distance between uh, SO3 squared plus the square root of the distance of the distance on R3 squared. So the R3 distance is just your familiar L2 distance or Euclidean distance. And the SO3 distance is kind of what we formalized with the logarithmic map and the Fermini storm last time. So, so far, I hope everything is a bit clearer. The background is a bit fast, but uh, this is kind of like what we need to actually build full flow. Uh, 
So before we actually build full flow, we have to kind of like pay our uh, kind of respects to the, the precursor to this work, which is kind of like this, this idea of how do we do flow matching on Riemannian manifolds? So uh, so what is this idea of flow matching? So if you're familiar with diffusion models, and and, and um, these, these these days it's hard not to be familiar with diffusion models because of that they kind of like dominate all the generative AI space. Uh, so, but I remind you again, a diffusion model is essentially uh, two SDEs, the forward SDE kind of takes your initial empirical data distribution and adds a little bit of Gaussian noise. Uh, in this case, it happens to be this Wiener process until you get to some unstructured noise at, at time step uppercase T. Now, the learning objective of this is to learn the reverse process, which is the time reversed process of the original forward process. And the way we learn it is to say that we want to learn this score function. The score function is the gradient of the log density at time T with respect to the input at time T. So if we have access to this uh, score function, we can simulate what's known as the reverse time SD and take a sample that starts at noise and slowly bring, brings you back to real data. So the learning objective is really to somehow parameterize and learn this. Now, in contrast, uh, even before diffusion models were popular, there was another uh, similar type of generative model, which is known as continuous normalizing flows. You might've heard this in the context of neural ordinary differential equations. So it's a very similar concept, but instead of having a, a stochastic dynamic, we have a deterministic di dynamic that's given to you by this ODE function over here. And the game is still the same. We start off with some empirical distribution, and then we kind of propagate this forward ODE until we get to some unstructured prior or noise. And the learning goal is to parameterize this reverse AD ODE that goes from unstructured noise back to your data. So uh, unlike, again, diffusion, this is a stochastic, uh, this is a deterministic dynamic. So what are the pros and cons of each approach, right? So why are diffusion models a bit more popular than the CNFs? So the reason diffusion models so far have dominated uh, generative models as opposed to CNFs is that they're easier to train, sample, uh, and essentially their objective function is much more amenable to uh, fast computation. So what do I kind of mean by that, right? So if you look at this uh, objective function for a diffusion model, and this is specifically the, 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 the denoising score matching objective, which is to say that, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a parameterized network, let's call it S, and we're going to match the, the noisy score estimate, which is a PT of X given Z, where X, Z is some sort of uh, previous time step or any other prior information that you have. So we simulate a noisy version of the original data point, and we match the score at every single time step T, right? And the why is this kind of easy to do? It's easy to do because like this expectation over here is over PT of X given Z. And for us, if you use Gaussian noise, we can kind of compute uh, the noisy sample at any time step t using a Gaussian convolution. So in some sense, you can kind of jump to the noisy sample without simulating the SDE. And this idea of simulation-free training is going to be really key, right? Now, if we contrast this with how CNFs were kind of trained before, you see that there's an integral over here. We have some data distribution, and we have to kind of simulate the ODE to be able to compute this objective over here. And this simulation-based training means that every time you do a forward pass or to complete the loss, you have to simulate the entire OD. And this becomes really expensive because in the backward pass, you have to backprop through the ODE solver itself, right? And this is kind of the reason why CNFs were kind of hard to scale and why diffusion models, and specifically when diffusion models use this Gaussian kind of convolution idea, are super easy to scale. Uh, but on the contrast, why are CNFs also pretty good? So at inference time, you only have to simulate an ODE. And simulating an ODE is much easier than simulating a, an SDE because there's no stochasticity involved. You have deterministic dynamics. And we have a, a much bigger uh, numerical toolkit when it comes to simulating ODEs. So how do we make simulation-free CNFs, right? So one way to do it is to say that, well, let's define like a probability path, right? So what is a probability path? A probability path is a one parameter diffeomorphism. So the parameter being time, such that at every point in time, you have some sort of evolving probability distribution. So at P0, let's say, or rho zero rather, you have your empirical data distribution, and then you're going to define a specific path on how this transforms to unstructured noise. And really, this is a this is a modeling decision. So you, we, can, we can define any sort of path we want. So one type of path is when if you keep on adding Gaussian noise, uh, another sort of path could be any other type of noise you want. So let's say for images, you can add a lot of, let's say, whitening transforms or blurring transforms or whatever have you. But defining this probability path, again, happens to kind of enable a lot of different applications. And, and, and the reverse of this probability path is a generation pathway. So if you can fix a probability path, 
you can kind of learn the reverse path uh, in a deterministic manner. Uh, so in particular, what this means is that if you define a probability path, uh, you can define a flow, which is kind of this, again, this kind of this way to transport mass on your manifold itself. So it's a solution to this ODE over here. So this, uh, I guess, psi t of x tells you how the particles are kind of evolving on the manifold itself. Now, everything's al already on the manifold, but if you're, it's easier to visualize, imagine that all this is on Euclidean space. And really what, what you need for this is to say that which direction do we need to follow? And the way we know this is this object called the vector field or the time dependent vector field, which tells you which way to transport the particles from your on your probability distribution at time step zero all the way to time step one. Given the initial condition that at psi zero of x, you have your initial data distribution. So the idea is to say that associated with every probability path, there happens to be a time dependent vector field that transports the particles from your initial empirical data distribution all the way to your uh, unstructured prior distribution. So this kind of concept is kind of really key. So I want to distinguish this word flow from the previous word flow, because this flow really refers to this solution of this ODE. While the previous flow was this idea of transporting probability mass. They're related, of course, and they're related through this ODE, and they're related to the continuity equation as well. So we say that a flow, psi t, generates a probability uh, path uh, from rho t if it pushes forward rho 0 to rho 1. So, so associated with every probability path, there uh, is a flow. But a flow may not always corresponding to uh, any probability path. So you have to define a probability path first, and then you get that it's associated flow. And really, the, the way that they're related is that uh, rho, uh, psi t pushes forward rho 0 to rho t. So what is this idea of flow matching now? So if you tell me, all I need for this flow is this time-dependent vector field. And imagine I had access to this time-dependent uh, time vector field at all time steps t. What would you want to do naturally, right? What we want to kind of do is to say that, well, we want to get a noisy sample at time step t from our probability path that we constructed, because we constructed this, remember? We sampled this expectation, and then we kind of want to match the vector field that's pointing in the direction that takes us from row 0 to row 1. And we kind of parameterize this time-dependent vector field with this v theta. And if we had access to this, all we would want to do is kind of minimize this, like, uh, induced metric norm. Or, so over here, G corresponds to the metric. Uh, in Euclidean space, this would be your L2 distance. But in Riemannian space, this would be the norm induced by the metric. So it's really simple. We sample time uniformly, compute a noisy sample, rho t of xt, and then we just match the vector field associated with this sample. right? However, in practice, we never really have access to uh, ut of xt. Uh, and, and in, instead, uh, what we have access to is this conditional vector field. So in this conditional vector field object is a bit different, but it, it, it plays the same role. So this ut of xt given z. Now, what is the conditioning thing over here? Right? So in the case of uh, diffusion, the conditioning could have been the initial starting point, and it's like a Gaussian convolution. So you need to know where you start from, kind of. right? And, and if you can match the conditional vector field at every time step uh, t, then you also have a similar objective. And it turns out in the original Riemannian flow matching paper and the previous flow matching paper, they kind of proved that these two objectives, although different, they have the same gradients. So when you optimize with respect to parameters theta, you're optimizing for the right thing anyway. But the key difference is that in practice, we can compute this. Sorry, uh, we can compute ut of xt given z, but we cannot compute ut of xt. So how are these two objects related? So a conditional vector field uh, is related to the marginal vector field if you just integrate out the conditioning information. And similarly, uh, the conditional probability path, P, uh, rho t of x t given c, uh, z, is related to the, the marginal vector field if we just, I'm oh, sorry, marginal probability path, rather, if you just integrate out the, the, the marginalization or the conditioning information, rather. And as I mentioned earlier, the two objectives are related because the gradients are the same. So in, in practice, when you optimize for this, you're optimizing for the right thing anyway. But in, but crucially, we have all the information we need to compute uh, ut of xt given z. So in pictures, how are these kind of related, right? So what is flow matching kind of doing? So 
Uh, flow matching in the original version, we, we start off with some prior and we kind of push it forward to, uh, in this case, three different colored Gaussian distribution. Now, conditional flow matching, the one that I discovered, uh, described to you earlier, where your condition is doing the same thing, but the paths they're learning are conditional vector field paths or the conditional probability paths. So the paths don't exactly correspond to the same paths as the unconditional version, but they're related. And finally, the one thing we're going to kind of work toward in this talk is how do we make sure that these paths don't cross each other? In some sense, the red one goes to the red one without crossing the green one or the blue one. And this is the idea of using optimal transport. We kind of want to have paths that are straight in some notion of the word straight. Uh, and, and in some sense, if they're more straight, they happen to be a bit more stable and shorter, and which makes for an easier optimization objective. So this is what we want to work towards. All right, so after all this kind of background information, I think we can finally talk about the main contributions of this work, which is full flow. Now, I remind you again, for full flow, we needed, we were trying to model proteins. Now, proteins are essentially elements in SE3N. So they have symmetries with respect to rotations and translations. Uh, unfortunately, you can't define an invariant measure of translation on the group SE3N because Rn itself is not a compact group. So you can't have a uniform distribution of compact groups. So what you can instead do is first uh, subtract away all the global translations. So you can kind of project it to like a n minus one dimensional subspace. Uh, for notation, we, we're going to call this SE3N0. And in this subspace, you can define an invariant measure. Now, the entire game for us is to say, we want to kind of transport probability masses on this manifold itself. So in some sense, because we're already on the manifold, we're going to be learning equivariant functions. So our networks themselves don't have to be equivariant as long as they're restricted to the manifold, but they will naturally learn an equivariant map as a result. So the next step is that once we kind of recognize where our distributions live on, which is SE3N0, we have to define a metric again because we want to do some computations. Uh, and we can kind of reuse the metric that I kind of outlined in the background, which is to say that any two objects on SE3 can be computed using this inner product on SE3, which kind of decomposes into an inner product on SO3, as well as the inner product on R3. And this is really nice for us because what this means is that we kind of decouple SO3 and, and R3 for each residue which means that you can treat all the residues separately in, in some sense, right? You can have a separate flow for all the different residues because this metric decomposes just very nicely. If we had chosen a different metric where these two things were, would be a bit more entangled, we wouldn't have this freedom. So this choice is not arbitrary. So what does it mean to actually learn conditional vector fields on SO3? So SO3, uh, has, has a really nice visualization uh, in terms of uh, the, the sphere S2, which happens to be its homogeneous space. So this is not exactly the group, but it's it's, it's, it's its homogeneous space. And a homogeneous space associated with a leading group just means that you can kind of take any point on this manifold, let's say the sphere S2, and apply a group action, let's put in this case it's rotation, and you will get to another point on the manifold itself, which is the sphere. And you can reach any point from any point with one rotation. That's the definition of a homogeneous space. So for conditional vector fields, I remind you that we're trying to parameterize ut of rt given z, where rt is a time-dependent uh, rotation matrix, let's say, given some conditioning information z. I'll specify what z is in a second, but the key idea is that ut, because it's a vector field, lives in the tangent space of the manifold. So imagine there is a tangent space associated with every little dot over here, and we kind of want to learn this black line, which tells you where to transport r1 to r0. And then the reverse time, we're going to go from the other way. So in our case, we say the conditioning information is R0 and R1. So we fix the endpoints of this uh, path. So we know where the starting point is and we know where the endpoint is. So if uh, I think if R0 is data, R1 would be like a random matrix, right? And we say that given these two paths, we want to compute all the different rotation matrices associated with this at every point on this black line, so which is an and some sort a noisy version of a rotation matrix. And then we want to compute the vector field UT, which transports us. So the way we do this is to say, well, how do we compute RT? Uh, RT is the noisy version of the vector field. So, it, so we can uh, compute RT using this kind of closed form expression, which tells you we start off with R1, and then we pull it back to the, the tangent space at R0 using the logarithmic map at R0. And then you multiply it by time T, and we take the exponential map. So what is the geometric picture here? Let's start off with R1 over here. 
and then we will pull it back to the to the, the tangent space at r0, but we'll multiply it by some time t. So we're somewhere on this black line, and then we map back to the manifold using the exponential map at r0. So this operation over here allows us to smoothly interpolate rotation matrices on each of these different black lines. So if you give me two starting points, which is r0 and r1, we can interpolate kind of smoothly. And this happens to be the geodesic interpolant, which means that this is the shortest path connecting r1 and r0. So this is a very kind of principal choice. Now, one complication that I mentioned a bit earlier is that, well, in practice, computing exponential and logarithmic maps for SO3, you need to compute matrix exponential and matrix logarithms. And these are infinite power series, and some of them can be expensive. So we can kind of play a, a kind of like a numerical trick. So the first numerical trick is to say that, well, actually, uh, when we get back to the, the tangent space at R0, we can compute the, the rotation vector version of the, of the, the group element. Now it's no longer a matrix, it's a vector version. And the logarithmic map of the vector version no longer is a matrix power series. There's a very nice closed form expression. And when you do that, you kind of bypass all the difficulty in computation with the matrix logarithm. And when we go back to the exponential map, we can always convert back from rotation vector to rotation matrix format via quaternions. So the details are a bit uh, nasty, so I won't go into them. But the, the key trick is to say that we don't always work with rotation matrices. Work with them when it's convenient. And in this case, for numerical computation, it's inconvenient to work with rotation matrices when we work uh, compute the logarithmic map. So uh, given RT, we want to compute the ODE associated with this conditional flow. So the ODE is just the, the time derivative of RT, so RT dot, which tells us exactly what is the direction of, of the flow that we have to follow, what's the vector field. So in a naive implementation, if you wanted to do a Ramanian flow matching, what would you do? Well, you would simply say V theta of T, uh, XT, minus RT dot. So in practice, what, this, what does this actually look like? We would compute RT using the previous geodesic interpolant formula. Then we would use auto diff or automatic differentiation to compute RT dot. So for every forward pass in our loss computation, we would need to do a backward pass to compute RT. Now, this can potentially be really expensive because for every forward pass, there's an associated backward pass, even before you compute the final objective, which is another backward pass, right? So how can we kind of like avoid doing this? So one trick is to say, well, let's try to exploit the geometry of the problem a little bit, right? And see if we can kind of, kind of come up with the closed form expression for RT dot. So now, if we want to gain intuition, we kind of want to look at like what happened in Euclidean space. So if you were doing kind of flow matching in Euclidean space, if you had any uh, essentially point along your geodesic or your, your flow, where would you want to go? So you want to go from S0 to S1. So you always have a vector that points you in the direction of your S1. So in the case of uh, Euclidean stuff, this would just be xt minus x0. But because you're already at, at, at some time step t, you want to accelerate within the remaining time to get to your, your end point. So you divide by t, right? So, so the, the picture is the following. We want to know which direction the vector is pointing and how fast we want to go. So the, the direction is given to you by this operation xt minus x0. And how fast you want to go is how much time you have left to get there. Similarly, for SO3, we kind of say, well, what is the equivalent operation for SO3? So instead of negative, because remember, rotation matrices, the, the, the group operation happens to be matrix multiplication. And the negative operation, because these are orthogonal matrices, are transpose. So the, the, the negative operation has a very nice corresponding thing. So we want to compute the relative angle between RT and R0, because that's the direction we want to go. And we compute the logarithmic map, because we want to be on the, on the uh, have a direction vector. And we divide by t, because we, that's how fast we want to accelerate. So in some sense, this is exactly equivalent to rt dot. And this is telling you this is a constant velocity vector field that transports you from rt in the direction to r, r0. So uh, this kind of leads us to our first kind of objective, which is the full flow base model. So the full flow base model can simply be say they're using this a loss function. So the key idea is that we, again, uniformly sample time. Now, uh, because we define our probability path, we can compute any point on uh, on RT using this 
geodesic interpolant. And then we can compute the associated vector field UT at that time by using this formula over here. And then we just simply match all the, the corresponding time elements uh, and learn this vector field V theta. So in this case, I'm only showing you the SO3 objective because the R3 objective is probably really familiar. But in the actual full flow model, this last component has an SO3 component as well as an R3 component. And you would repeat this for every residue you have in your protein backlog. So this is only for one residue, but you can repeat this n times for each residue. So yeah, so what are the key ideas that we use? So we use the log map. Uh, we computed the log map using the rotation vector parameterization to avoid the matrix logarithm. We avoided the, the RT dot computation by uh, simply looking at uh, looking for a closed form expression of UT. And then we compute this, uh, I guess, norm, which is the SO3 induced norm. And then you can do this uh, almost in parallel. Now, the next step is to say, well, how do you want to build kind of like straighter vector fields so that they don't cross? So, and this is kind of this idea of optimal transport. So the idea is as follows. I want to build a vector field or conditional flow, such that these two paths never cross each other. And they're both geodesic. So in some sense, you, what you want to do is kind of like want to pair up R1 with the, its appropriate R0. And, and this initial pairing is, is really what's telling you what is the path between them. Because once you fix the pairing, you know the shortest path is going to be a ge geodesic. So the initial pairing is what's kind of like the key thing over here. So previously, we were pairing random objects. So we were, we were taking a, one protein backbone and pairing with a random protein, with random SE3 N0 group element. But now we want to be a bit more principled about how this pairing would happen. So the way we do it is that uh, we would solve this optimal transport problem on, on the Ramanian manifold. So for Ramanian manifolds, there's an equivalent optimal transport problem called the Ramanian OT problem. And in and the, and the Monge for, uh, formula, formulation of the problem, we have this kind of uh, infimum or, or optimization problem where you have some sort of a cost function C. Now, C is the geodesic cost associated with transporting probability mass uh, X with its push forward operation psi, psi of X. So the geodesic cost is equivalent to the geodesic distance that we, we talked about earlier, right? And if you minimize this cost, it tells you which pairings from row zero will match with which pairings from row one. So in this current form, this is kind of like difficult to work with. So there's a corresponding OT problem called the Kantorovich problem. And in our paper, we kind of proved that in this Kantorovich problem, the geodesic interpolant uh, or, or the push forward map happens to be the geodesic interpolant. So this exponential of gradient of nabla of uh, some potential. Uh, in this case, you can simply use the cost associated with SE3N. So the idea is, is the following. We sample uh, a batch of proteins and we sample a batch of noise. And we solve this OT problem by minimizing the, the geodesic cost. And the key thing is that this cost function will decompose naturally over all of the different uh, SE3 objects in SE3N. So you want to do some sort of global alignment. So the cost is the sum of all the costs, not just only one object in SE3. And when you do that global alignment, that tells you what is the closest noise pairing to your initial sample data point. And you can kind of do this as like a pre-processing step. And in practice, for batch sizes of 512 or 1024, this doesn't add any significant overhead. So the, what is the key ingredients? The key ingredients is that to solve Riemannian OT, we need this McCann interpolant, which happens to be for us the rho T. And this is the exponential map that I showed earlier. And we need some sort of coupling. So the coupling is which pairing of X0 has to be paired with X1. So for, for SE3N, we can, again, do this geodesic cost N times and just add it up as one global cost. Right. So. How does this actually change full flow base? So the main thing that changes when you compare to full flow base for full flow OT is this expectation over here. So the expectation is with respect to now this coupling that we've learned called pi bar. And I'm saying pi bar because I'm only showing you the, the, the SO3 uh, version of the loss function, but in practice we'll have an SO3 as well as an R3 version of the loss. So this tells you which R0 and which R1 to pair up. So in, in, in pictures, this means which red dot will pair up with which blue dot. And once you have this pairing, you have the shortest path, which is defined to you again by the geodesic, and the rest of the computation remains exactly the same. So there's a small overhead, but this leads to a significant improvement in terms of a lot of the performance.
So finally, we have a third model that we introduced, which is the, perhaps the most complicated model. Uh, and the reason it's the most complicated model is that we kind of want to, uh, instead of defining deterministic paths, we want to define stochastic paths. And the reason why stochastic paths are interesting for us is that one of the key reasons that diffusion works really well in, in higher dimensions for images and other domains is that uh, it's more robust because of the noise. Because if you're learning with noise, you become a bit more robust to it at inference time. So uh, in, uh, what does this actually mean for, let's say, stochastic paths on manifolds? So and stochastic paths on manifolds is kind of given to you by this idea of called what's called a Brownian bridge, which is telling you if I have two fixed endpoints, what is the stochastic ODE that transports you from that one endpoint to another endpoint and make sure it terminates with probability one at each endpoint? So it will have the highest variance in the middle, but at each endpoint, it's almost deterministic. In Euclidean space, this, this Brownian bridge is given to you by this uh, SD over here, where you have some ST minus S0, where S0 is your starting point, divided by T. So this is kind of like, like almost like the, the vector field direction or your, or your uh, drift direction. And then you add some sort of scaled uh, Gaussian noise or Wiener process. And you kind of add this additively until you reach S1, which is, uh, which is terminal time, or and you start from S0. Um, so the, the cool thing about Euclidean space is that all of this you can kind of do in a simulation-free way because you can exploit the Gaussian convolution trick. So this is like one of the nice things why SDEs and like diffusion models and even flow matching uh, are so super nice to do on images because you can just use a Gaussian convolution right away. And you have a closed form expression for, for this entire SDE and specifically this uh, probability distribution, conditional probability distribution of ST given S0, S1. Uh, unfortunately for general Ramanian manifolds, we don't really have this nice closed form solution because we would kind of want to do the same thing. So what does a Brownian bridge look like in SO3? So we're doing the same idea over here. We do the logarithmic map at RT given R0. So it's again, the, the vector field that's pointing you in the right direction divided by time. And then you add some sort of Brownian motion, but this Brownian motion is now Brownian motion on the manifolds. Uh, and and it's, just, it's the same business over here. But however, the key difference is that we no longer have simulation-free training because we don't really have access to this rho t of rt given r0 and r1. We can't use the same Gaussian convolution trick for manifolds. So this is the key part, point where things break down. So if you were to impl uh, implement this, what you would have to do is that you would actually have to sample an r tilde t, which is given to you by simulating the SDE. So you would simulate the SDE, and then you have a noise sample at rt. Then you would compute again the same kind of uh, vector field, which is the RT dot equivalent. And then you do this kind of flow matching uh, business again. Uh, but it, this can be really expensive to do. So what do we do instead? So instead, what we say is that, well, we kind of want to build a Brownian bridge. Uh, and this Brownian bridge kind of looks like this noisy little path over here. And then we kind of want to do, again, like a conditional flow matching. So a conditional flow matching in our paper, we showed that for SO3, the gradients again match. Uh, for unconditional and, and, and conditional paths. But the way we build this path is kind of like going to be the, the main departure point from simulating the ST. So we want to use a simulation-free approximation to the previous Browning bridge. So the way we do that is that we say that, well, what's the equivalent or the natural equivalence of a Gaussian distribution on SO3? Uh, in, this, in our case, this happens to be the IGSO density, so the isotropic Gaussian on SO3. And we'll we'll play this following game. We'll say that we know the endpoints, R0 and R1, and each point along the geodesic, we'll, what we're going to say is that we're going to fit an IGSO density, so uh, where the mean of the density is this point RT, which is given to you by this geodesic interpolant, and then with some sort of variance. So we have this evolving Gaussian distribution along each path over here. So I'll go back to the previous picture, So which is to say that look at this orange point over here. At every point over here, we're going to fit a se separate IGSO density. And that's the kind of the idea. And having an IGSO density um, allows us to kind of like simulate this because we have close form access to IGSO. So this is a simulation free approximation, uh, but it may not be the exactly the same Brownian bridge uh, as we would care for. So how bad uh, can this approximation be? So numerically, we try to simulate this a little bit to say, OK, well, what is the simulated SD? which is the right thing you should do, versus this IGSO approximation. So over here, I have three different plots of three different simulations where the, 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 the 
bold black line is the actual simulated LSD, and the, the dotted red line is our numerical approximation using IGSO. And, and, and as you can see, we, the approximation is a, is a fairly good approximation. And, and the key idea is that we can now compute this really fast and really cheaply like we would want to do. So this, this kind of gives us a little bit of hope to scale to higher dimensional problems and, and uh, like higher dimensional like protein tasks. Okay. So combining all these two, three things together, that kind of gives us our full flow S SFM. Now we can actually apply this to like real more important uh, protein problems. But before we do that, we kind of want to build it intuition for how do these actually look like for toy tasks. So in this case, what we first tried was this toy uh, multimodal distribution on and on SO3. So this is just simply a mixture of Gaussians, and we're visualizing using the the Euler angle format. So the the leftmost uh, visualization is your data distribution, and each of the three visualizations after that are a full flow base for SO3 full flow OT for SO3 and full flow SFM for, for SO3 again. So as you can kind of see, like they're already pretty good. Uh, I would say the SFM version is a bit more robust to noise. It uh, has a little bit less uh, spread of the particles, but operationally, they're all almost equally as good. Uh, so in terms of pictures, when we want to move to proteins, what are we actually exactly doing? So in proteins, we have some initial prior distribution R1, which is some random elements. In this case, this random looking blob. And we have, our, we have our data distribution, which is like an actual sample a protein backbone. And we want to kind of like build all of our models for each of these three use cases. And I remind you again, for, for full full base, we're just pairing random uh, protein uh, proteins. And we're kind of building this geodesic interpolant for full full OT. We have a very specific pairing given to us by this learned coupling that we have using Romanian OT. And for full full SFM, we use the same coupling but we create stochastic dynamics instead of deterministic dynamics. So these are the three variations of our full flow model. So uh, when we're actually testing proteins, our protein backbones, uh, we need some sort of evaluation metrics. Uh, so in our case, we focused on three different metrics. The first one being designability. So the way we tested that is that just, we generated 50 protein backbones after we trained this on uh, a small PDB data set. Uh, for lengths 50, 100, 150, 200, 350, and 300. And then we, once we get the structure, we kind of apply a protein MPNN to get eight sequences. And then we kind of refold this using ESM fold. And the designability metric is to say that, well, how much of this refolded structure is close to the, the generated structure uh, if it's less than two angstrom? Uh, so this is kind of like a natural metric. I think many other papers also kind of use something similar. I think uh, FrameDiff also uses this, and also R of Diffusion also uses this. Now for diversity, we can compute the, the TM score or the average TM score of designable proteins. And this is the key distinction between uh, maybe frame diff is that we only compute the diversity on designable proteins. And the reason for that is that you can have a artificially high diversity on undes undesignable proteins. And that's really of no value to us. And we average the TM score across different lengths. And finally, we have this novelty metric, which is to say, what is the minimum TM score of designable proteins again, compared to the training data? Um, so in terms of numbers, uh, uh, for designability, we find that all the full flow models kind of like beat out all the, uh, the frame diff style models. Uh, and, and I should mention that the R of diffusion and Genie are trained on about a 10 X or hundred X larger data set and have four X uh, different model uh, capacities. But really the, the, the most natural comparison is with respect to frame diff because we're, uh, in practice, we use their architecture and we use their data set as well. Uh, so we noticed that like there's a significant jump uh, when it comes to using uh, full flow. And in particular, if you use full flow OT, we see that this leads to the most desi designable proteins. So we have 0.82 designability already. Um, however, uh, when you do OT, you lose a little bit of this uh, kind of this uh, novelty a little bit. So uh, the one of the like downsides for OT is that although you get more designable proteins, you take a small hit on novelty. And we find that for if you do full full SFM, we get the most novel proteins, although they're less designable. So there's a bit of a trade-off over here. Well, uh, but we're we're not fully sure why SFM is not as designable, but that's probably some sort of uh, result due to our numerical approximation of the exact Brownian motion. So that's that's one hypothesis, but we haven't really tested it out further. And the other key difference is that full flow, because we're doing flow matching, is more than twice as fast as 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 SC three diffusion. So this is really important for us when we want to actually build out larger models. Uh, 
so one of the things that actually really makes a difference in practice is this numerical trick, which really helps designability. And the numerical trick is this idea of inference annealing. And, 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 and this only happens in inference. So this does not happen in training at all. So when we want to actually generate proteins, what we do is to say that, well, we have some sort of vector field V theta, and we have some sort of IT. And IT is some, some constant scaling or some sort of learned scaling, whatever have you. So what we do is that we kind of like multiply uh, your learned vector field V theta by some uh, constant function, let's say 10. And we actually use 10 in the paper. And what we notice is that when you, when you do this, uh, 10 T, sorry, 10 T. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, when we when we actually do this in practice, we notice that the the norm, the rotation norm, actually does not blow up near the end end of inference. And this actually kind of helps a lot because at the end of inference is when you want to get your final generated protein. So this actually helps quite a bit near the end, and this leads to like a lot of a lot more designable proteins. So on the right plot over here, we kind of try to like visualize the effect of different uh, in inference in the link schemes. And we notice that if you have like kind of like 10 T, the, the RMSD kind of like drops a little bit, right? So this is like a, a box plot over here with where the shaded region is the variance and the bar is the mean again. And if you have really bad uh, or really small inference scaling, we notice that the, the RMSD just, just blows up. So this idea of shooting fast at the beginning and slowing down near the end really, really helps um, kind of like uh, lead to more and more, much more designable proteins. So we have a lot more details about these experiments in the appendix, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on another experiment, which is kind of, I think, really cool because uh, unlike diffusion models, uh, flow matching approaches have this unique advantage, which is to say that you can start from any prior distribution and it doesn't have to be necessarily a uniform distribution or a Gaussian distribution on any manifold. So diffusion models are kind of like hampered by this. So this means that we can take an empirical data set as your prior, and then we can go to another uh, target distribution uh, uh, on the manifold. So what is a, a example of this? So if you want to do equilibrium confirmation generation, what we can say is that uh, we can model the equilibrium distribution of a protein given its initial predicted structures from a, a pre-trained folding model, like a mega fold, ESM fold, whatever have you. And the idea is to say, well, we can have as your target 200,000 frames, which are sampled at five nanoseconds using actual MD simulations. In our case, we use a specific protein, BPTI. And the goal is to say that well, we have our initial starting point, uh, and then we have our end starting point, and it doesn't have to be a uniform prior distribution. It's an empirical data set. And we want to kind of like see if we can hit all the different modes of this distribution. And that's really the name of the game here. So the way we tested this is to say that we use inference to test against 20,000 unseen frames of the same trajectory. So how does this actually do in practice? Uh, so for this specific protein, BPTI, we have three different plots. The first plot is a Rama plot of the of the, the psi, phi and psi angles of the most flexible residue 56. And you can kind of see that like full flow does a pretty good job of hitting all the different, uh, I guess, dense regions. And then in the middle plot over here, I have the, an ICA of all the dihedral angles of BPTI. And the cool thing is that uh, it kind of matches really well with the MD simulation. So they, these, again, these dense regions, which are the black ones over here, the MD simulations, the, the red contours are pro flow. And the, and the more impressive thing is that alpha fold two cannot hit all the different regions. So full flow is able to kind of like, because it's a generative model by design, kind of learn the different modes a much better. And then on the right, we have uh, finally an alpha fold generated structure, as well as the C alpha alignment uh, of, I think, uh, uh, some test MD frames. So I think, um, oh, sorry. Uh, the one last thing I want to kind of show is an actual generated sample. This is actually the, the trajectory uh, at inference time. You start off from almost a blob and until you get to a, a final protein. And then really the last experiment that we had is like an ablation of the different aspects of the flow flow model. So we have stochasticity, OT. There's some auxiliary loss functions that we didn't actually have time to go through, but they're the same as frame diff, if you ever, if you read that paper, and then inference annealing. So we see that like stochasticity helps, but OT is the real winner when you want designable proteins. And all of this matters in terms of inference annealing. So you have to do inference annealing if you want to get the most designable proteins. And if you do none of them, you get pretty much nothing. So that's the, this is the key method over here. Uh, 
So I think uh, with that, I will end this talk and uh, allow for questions. And so here's even more generated samples. Um, and then, yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Are there any questions? I can ask a question if it's okay. Yes, um, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if you have any intuitive way to explain why the OT um, flow model was giving so much more designability than the base model. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the reasons that we think that the OT model is much more designable is that I think it just leads to a better optimization objective. So the paths that you're learning are are straighter and shorter, right? So when you do that, the optimization objective is a is, is a much more numerically stable and much more cleaner objective. So you get to like better solutions when you just train. So because the paths are simpler, when you do inference, it's easier to simulate simpler paths because in inference we're trying to learn the, the simpler path, and you have a much better target of where you want to go given a fixed noise. So that's that's the the intuition that that we have so far. Thank you. More questions. I have one as well. So uh, I I work a lot on dynamic enzymes, and I I wonder how you could envision the incorporation of certain amino acids and their effect on the conformation on the conformational ensemble. So like a a huge uh, problem is predicting you know a certain mutation that changes the conformation ensemble and how you would incorporate that because you kind of need to go beyond this, just the C alpha uh, for, to do this. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, maybe I'll pass this on to my other co-author who just happens to be also on the call. Uh, Cheng Hao, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so sorry, we were at uh, we we're at a conference and that's why we could only hop on last 10 minutes. Uh, so <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, that's a great question indeed. Uh, I think our next step, particularly, especially, will be modeling these small granular changes in uh, protein in amino acid sequences that cause confirmation changes. There, we have several ideas on how to do it. Uh, we'll have to basically explore which one works better than the other. But uh, one thing is model small granular changes, and the second is actually the model in the full conformational space of a given protein, right? Uh, I, and especially disorder protein. That's something we'll be working on in the coming three to six months. Yeah. And I can also add, there have been actually a lot of current work. So C alphas, or, you know, basically the small, like, it's just a lot easier to simulate C alphas mm -hmm. to, to limit the representation. But there have been a lot of work, including Rosetta Diffusion, where they actually do explicit representations. And mm -hmm. there would actually, it gives it a very nice way to generalize to kind of chemics, chemistries that have not been observed in training. And if you do it that way in the future, I guess that, that that should work because then you have a representation for atoms and there are only 21 atoms. And uh, yeah, this would handle this chemistries that are not, you know, basically not in the training set. But so far, we just did a very simple thing. But I, I think it's a really good question and, you know, actually observe a lot of additional performance because from training on other data sets, which have non-canonical amino acids. Including including PTM secondary modifications that that could be really cool to do as well at some point. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. More questions. I have a question. So the um, RF diffusion performance still seems to be higher, and I think one of the reasons why that might be the case is that they're able to leverage pre-training with the Rosetta Fold model. And I'm curious on how you might think about incorporating prior knowledge, maybe pre-training or in some other context into uh, uh, in order to increase the performance and maybe match or exceed what, what we're seeing with RF diffusion? Right. That's a very good question. I think um, you hit the nail on the head. Like I think one of the reasons that RF diffusion does so well is that it, it leverages pre-training, but it's also trained on a much, much larger data set. And the model is about four times larger as well. Uh, so these two, three factors rather, are, are I think in our view, the most important reason why they're, it's more performant. So in a similar vein, I think we can also leverage a lot of what they did, right? We can use a, a much larger data set. So we only trained on 22,000 PDBs. We can also use a much larger model and we can use almost exactly the same type of model that they use. So we can kind of use the pre-trained backbone as well. So there's nothing preventing us from doing so. Uh, we just didn't have the time to do it yet. 
Uh, and that's really our next goal, honestly, uh, to scale this up to like our diffusion style. And I think we're optimistic that the flow matching approach might be better. So there's no technical limitations for incorporating not, their like, not architecture the backbone into this. Got it. Not at the moment. Not at awesome. the moment. That's great to hear. More questions. I have a question. Um, it's a little bit technical in nature. Um, so you mentioned the um, inference annealing was really important for your your metrics. Um, I and and while you were discussing that, you also mentioned that this isn't a problem during training. Um, I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more why this is an issue during training. Yeah. So in training, it's it's not an issue because. Uh, we have a lot of control over the loss. So in training, what, what are we doing? I mean, there's a lot of numerical tricks that are happening in addition to this, this loss competition. There's like NAN guards. There's like, we throw out like things that are too big. We clip gradients. We do all those stuff, right? And inference, we do none of that, right? So because we kind of want to reuse the learned vector field. So we have a lot of control of how training performs. But in inference, uh, because we're kind of beholden to the numerical solvers that we have, we don't actually do a lot of these extra checks. So this inference link is kind of like our rudimentary check to kind of prevent norms blowing up. And there may be a more principled answer to why this works, uh, but our, our cursory answer right now is that we want to control the gradient norm all the way to the end of the training. And we don't want any blow ups, otherwise you don't get real proteins. Yeah, and I think another answer is that we want to look more carefully into um, different types of uh, inference annealing schedules and just like why exactly this works, but the short answer is there is a sudden increase in the norm um, um, at small t and um, the inference annealing just takes care of that. So you don't have this high um, norm. But we can investigate this more as well. So uh, we really appreciate you sharing the code to be able to dig into the details of it. I'm curious if you have plans on releasing the weights or making like an accessible app use of you know, actually trying the model in practice? Yeah, yeah, so that's a very good question. I think within the next couple of days, everything should be up, including training weights, uh, as well as training code, as well as inference code. We're just cleaning it up so that, so that it's very easy to use, uh, but it, we're almost there. And within the end of the week, you should be able to see it. And if you don't, please ping us. Awesome, we're looking forward to it. More questions? Okay, well, let's let's thank Joey one more time. And yeah, we really appreciate you coming and giving us a really detailed uh, walkthrough and, and it was really fantastic to see. So we see some new faces. I hope you come back in two weeks. We'll, we'll have another paper. So look for it on our website or Twitter and we'll try to um, make sure that it's accessible to everybody. So thank you again and, and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you.